Today is January the 6th, 2021. Last week, PRN.FM experienced an electrical hit. I have gotten feedback from listeners that the live streaming of the personal computer show last Wednesday was not on, but they were able to download the podcast. If you missed the program, you can download the podcast of the December 30th show on PRN.FM. Welcome to the award-winning Personal Computer Show. I'm Hank Key and my colleague is Joe King. Do you know who has your personal data? Do you know how Facebook, Google, Amazon, and other big tech companies are using your personal data? Our website is PCRadioShow.org. We are heard each Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on PRN.FM, streaming on the Internet. Podcast of the program is available on PRN.FM on the Internet. You can leave us a message with your question or comment at hank at pcradioshow.org. What free streaming services are there for the cord cutters? 2020 brought us several new streaming services and more free content. Redbox launched two new free services for live and on-demand content. Fox brought more of its network content to Tubi. Crackle delivered original series. And in the end, Pluto TV took the prize when Cord Cutters News readers voted it the best free streaming service of 2020. I've been using it, and it's great. It even has a free Showtime channel free. It's not a trial. It's not for a short period of time. It's there free. Pluto TV took 45.4% of the votes, and I'm not surprised to see this service on top. Viacom CBS has been investing in new streaming channels, bringing content from across its portfolio brands to the service at no cost and continuously improving Pluto TV all year. The Roku channel came in second with 24.7% of the votes. The free streaming service from Roku, launched in 2017, now reaches U.S. households with an estimated 43 million people. A new app for the channel has made it even easier to watch content for free anytime, anywhere. Pluto TV and Roku channel accounts for almost 75% of all free streaming services. Tubi TV, IMDV TV, and Crackle rounded out the top five free streaming services in 2020. Each has a library filled with movies, classic TV series, family friend shows, hard to find titles, exclusive content, and much more. And I find that uh, you don't have to point your antenna in different directions. Just keep it simple. Just go onto the internet. By the way, if you also have a Samsung Smart TV that was purchased after 2016 or in the United States after 2015, They have Samsung TV Plus, and it offers TV for free. What is Samsung TV Plus? If you just bought a new Samsung TV and you're seriously considering it, or just haven't gotten around to learning more about what the smart TV interface is, you may well be wondering what this free content service is all about. Samsung TV Plus is designed as a free, ad-supported content platform offering a unique mix of TV channels depending on your region. The region, in this case, the United States, has 115 channels. This means you can get right to watching on-demand programming without having to pay for a Netflix or Disney Plus subscription at all. If you come across Samsung TV Plus before and didn't think there was much on it for you, that has changed in the past few months. There are now over twice as many TV channels worldwide that's 518 channels, and double the number of Samsung TVs supporting the app since last year. Well, Samsung TV Plus has got something of an overhaul on 2017 to 2020 Samsung TVs with a new overlay layout that summarizes recently viewed channels as well as top recommendations tailored to your own content portal rather than an add-on. Cut to the chase. What is Samsung TV Plus free? It's ad-supported content service exclusive to Samsung TVs. Despite similar naming conventions, it is not a paid subscription service in the vein of Disney Plus or Apple TV Plus. Samsung TV Plus was created in 2015, and 
Samsung TV Plus channels are there. It varies from country to country. You can't delete the entire app from your Samsung TV if you buy a Samsung Smart TV, though you can remove individual channels within the app for a clean interface. Is Samsung TV Plus the same as Rakuten TV? No. The TV Plus app does include some Rakuten TV channels, though. Samsung TV Plus is available in a total of 11 countries right now, and you can find Samsung TV Plus app by turning on the television and heading to the Samsung TV Plus icon on the home screen. It should be on the far left in a fixed position rather than mixed with third-party apps. Each country benefits from a mix of news, sports, and entertainment channels. In the United States, that means you get the likes of CBSN, USA Today, Fubo Sports Network, Be In Sports, IGN, Anime All Day, Comedy Dynamics, Kitchen Nightmares, Docurama, Wipeout, Taste Made, and Toon Goggles. There are a host of dedicated movies and music channels, too. So if you happen to have a Samsung Smart TV, well, besides a Samsung TV Plus, add to it Pluto TV. Add to it the Roku Channel. You probably have more content to watch than you have time for it. T-Mobile has announced a data breach exposing customers' proprietary network information, including phone numbers and call records. T-Mobile began texting customers that a security incident exposed their account information. According to T-Mobile, its security team recently discovered malicious, unauthorized access to their systems after bringing in a cybersecurity firm to perform an investigation. T-Mobile found that bad actors gained access to the telecommunications information generated by customers' proprietary network information. The information exposed in this breach includes phone numbers, call records, and the number of lines on an account. This information, as defined by the Federal Communications Commission rules, was access. The CPNI access may have included phone numbers, number of lines, subscribed to, on your account, and in some cases, call-related information collected as part of the normal operation of your wireless service. T-Mobile states that the data breach did not expose account holders' names, physical addresses, email addresses, financial data, credit card information, social security numbers, tax IDs, passwords, or PINs. In a statement, T-Mobile stated that this breach affected a small number of customers. About 200,000 people were affected by this breach out of approximately 100 million customers. They are currently notifying a small number of customers that some information related to their account may have been illegally accessed. The data access did not include any names associated with the account, financial data, credit card information, social security numbers, passwords, pins, or physical email addresses. The information that was accessed may have included phone numbers, number of lines subscribed to, and a small number of cases, some core related information collected as part of normal operation and service. Those who receive the text alert about this breach should be on the lookout for suspicious texts claiming to be from T-Mobile asking for information or containing links to non-T-Mobile web pages. It is not uncommon for bad actors to use stolen information for further targeted phishing, smishing, campaigns that attempt to steal sensitive information, such as login names and passwords. The FCC orders phone companies to help trace illegal robocallers. It's now also putting a limit on non-telemarketing robocalls. The FCC has been adopting more and more measures to combat robocalls, and the latest set of rules it's implementing include limiting even non-telemarketing calls made to residential phones. Non-commercial, commercial and non-profit organizations can now only make up to three calls per residential number within 30 days and are required to allow recipients to opt out. The FCC didn't have a limit for non-telemarketing calls before this change. By the way, non-telemarketing includes all those politicians. In addition, the Commission has introduced new rules for voice service providers, which are now required to respond to traceback requests for illegal core sources from the Commission and from law enforcement. 
they're now also required to investigate illegal calls identified by the commission and to take steps to mitigate those calls if they come to the same conclusion. The FCC says carriers must exercise due diligence in ensuring that their services are not used to originate illegal traffic as well. Aside from implementing those new rules, the FCC has expanded safe harbors for providers to eliminate legal liability for network-level core blocking. That said, providers must only target cores that are highly likely to be illegal, not a simple unwanted, and must use human oversight. In an effort to be more transparent, the FCC requires providers to notify callers if they've been blocked. Phone companies must also provide subscribers with a list of blocked calls upon request and provide a status update on call blocking disputes within 24 hours. 2020 was supposed to be the year of 5G smartphones, the year when people would finally have access to 5G on a smartphone. Because of the pandemic, people spent much more time indoors, relying on home broadband and Wi-Fi to serve up the Internet, sometimes leaving mobile networks underutilized and underappreciated. This meant all the 5G hype and promises did not translate into any discernible impact on the consumer market. In terms of speed, the numbers are pretty clear. For those who have access to sub-6 gigahertz or 2.5 gigahertz, 5G, which makes up a large part of T-Mobile's 5G network, 5G increases mobile data speed by around 15-20%. to That's not exactly a game-changer. And the improved speeds aren't something you really notice on a day-to-day basis. As for the millimeter wave 5G, that's the high-speed one. And if you're on Verizon or 5G Plus on AT&T, mobile data hit download speeds upwards of 1,500 megabits per second. While you won't get those speeds all the time, according to speed tests, those peak numbers are almost 10 times faster than the U.S. average fixed broadband speeds of 170 megabits per second and more than 20 times faster than the average mobile data speed, 63 megabits per second. The problem is that even though U.S. carriers aren't charging extra for access to 5G, with so many people stuck at home and traveling significantly less, the impact of 5G has been seriously muted. Millimeter wave 5G doesn't penetrate through walls and windows, which means if you're indoors, there's no 5G to be had. The real issue is that adding 5G support tends to bump up the price of a handset by around $100 or more. That's a rough price hike to swallow, especially when you consider the economic times this past year. There's one thing we often say, don't buy for tomorrow's needs anything associated with computer technology. For tomorrow, it will be cheaper or better. Of course, if you're part of the 1%, money we know is not a factor. If you really truly have your heart set on getting a new 5G phone, it's best to make sure the phone supports both sub-6 gigahertz 5G and millimeter wave 5G, even though it will make the phone more expensive. While it's somewhat hidden, We can see this increase simply by looking at the launch price of a bunch of new 5G phones that came out this past year. The iPhone 11 was launched at $700, while the new 5G iPhone 12 came in at $800. It's true that the latest crop of iPhones and smartphones as a whole comes with new features like wireless charging and better screens. However, the cost of many of those new features are offset by price reductions of older or less advanced components. It's a similar story for Samsung with the standard Galaxy S20 launching at $1,000 and not even supporting the millimeter wave 5G compared to a launch price of $900 for last year's Galaxy S10. The Galaxy S20 Ultra launch price of $1,400 made most iPhones seem cheap. The price bump for 5G wasn't restricted solely to the big two either, as smaller phone makers like OnePlus was very clear 
that the move to 5G would result in increased prices for its phones. And, as expected this year, OnePlus 8 Pro came out at $900, which is more than $200 more than last year's OnePlus 7 Pro. But perhaps a clear indicator of a price bump occurs by adding 5G can be seen on the Google Pixel 5, which in the United States supports both sub-6 gigahertz and millimeter wave 5G and costs $700, while international versions of the Pixel 5 only featured support for the less expensive sub-6 gigahertz 5G and had price tags that are around $100 less. That's a significant difference just to support a cell network that you can only use outside. The extra drain caused 5G can turn battery life into a serious concern, especially on smaller phones like the iPhone 12 mini. Another important consideration is that because 5G modems suck up more juice than a standard 4G modem, 5G can have a significant impact on the overall battery life of a phone, and something that can weigh heavily on smaller 5G phones like the iPhone 12 mini. Now make no mistake, 5G is going to become increasingly important, especially as it pertains to new technologies like self-driving cars, mobile virtual reality, and more. But the reality of 5G, at least in 2020, it made phones noticeably more expensive without bringing the kind of impact you expect for the price. Right now, 5G support is a nice benefit for people with new phones that live in the right area. For those who don't feel a burning desire to upgrade immediately, the best tactic is sit tight. As with most technologies, increasing scale and efficiency helps bring prices down over time. And with phones like the Nord N10, 5G having recently gone on sale for under $300, it won't be too long until we have a much greater choice for affordable 5G handsets. The same goes for the Pixel 4a 5G, which is a great phone for the price even if you never use 5G. Alternatively, if you do need a new phone and don't feel like getting a feature you might not use, you may be able to tide yourself over by picking up one of last year's flagship phones, many of which have received steep discounts as device makers and carriers look to clear out inventory ahead of 2021. And because a number of this year's budget and mid-range phones like the standard Pixel 4a didn't include support for 5G either. They serve as strong potential candidates for people looking to avoid the 5G price differential. Joe, with the current hype on 5G, you probably want to add your commentary on this subject matter. Hank, I was about to spend over $1,000 for a, a new cell phone so that I could get the benefits of 5G when my when my supplier said they were carrying 5G. And then, then I heard what you had to say, and I found I, I couldn't believe it. You wouldn't make such a big mistake. But on the other hand, I checked the Verizon website, and I checked the Visible website, and neither of them mentioned the fact that I'd have difficulty or it would actually be impossible for me to use the 5G in my office. I mean, that's where I need it, is in my office. What, 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 what's the point of my spending $1,000 on a phone if, if I can't get anything better than what I'm getting right now? At any rate, I went out, I listened to you, and, and, and then I went out and I, I started doing some research. The, the Verizon website, not a mention. The Visible website, not a mention. I didn't bother with T-Mobile because they don't necessarily give me the information I really want in the first place. So I, I did a Google search. And you know what I found? The only thing I found was a review and an article from, 19, from 2019, which discusses that very point of not having sufficient bandwidth or not having sufficient power to go through a wall or a glass window or a piece of chicken wire for that matter, chicken fencing wire. So I, I, I couldn't believe it. I, I 
still have trouble believing it. I called you up and you said to me, well, it's right there on the IEEE site. All you've got to do is go over there and look at it. It's a little bit technical, but, but you'll understand it, Joe. So I went over there, and most of it I did not understand. I'm not an engineer, but it was quite clear, it was quite clear that the so-called 5G was really 4.5G at this point. And I, I can't tell you, Hank, how pleased I am to save the $1,000. I didn't really want to spend that amount on, a, on an Apple phone. Uh, I'm, I'm sitting here, and I'm... I'm I'm really, I don't know what to say to you. It's, it, it's sort of, in my mind, false advertising to sell me a product that I cannot use in my own home or in my office. Oh, I can use it, of course, but not get the benefit out of it that I thought I was paying $1,000 for, meaning the high speed. And then I saw the rest of the paragraph. And it's using a, a, a range of of uh, wireless that's been used by a variety of other places, so it's going to be overwhelmed with crowding in addition to not, not being used in my office. So I'm going to have to stand outside on the street, freezing my toes off and getting not the bandwidth I'm expecting because it's too busy. And the whole thing sounds to me like false advertising. Why are you the only one to say something about this on the personal computer show? Why am I not reading it on the tech pages of the New York Times? Why am I not reading it in everything that people are looking at? Why is it not mentioned on the website? The, the, the Apple website doesn't mention it. The Verizon website doesn't mention it. Why? That's a legitimate question, Hank. Why? Presenting Benjamin Rockwell with his IT Pro series, Concerns About Sneaker Net Repairs in a COVID-19 World. This is Benjamin Rockwell, and now it's time to get down to business. This is where I take a look at all of the different experience I have from the business world as an IT professional, and I share some of the impacts, some of the concerns, some of the different things that might not have come to your mind. And I was recently in a conversation and it went along the lines of this. What are some of the what would be the biggest concern that I would have as an IT professional in in the standard day-to-day -day work that really you haven't figured out a good solution for what are the biggest disasters because of COVID. All right, so I sit here and well, one big disaster is everybody working from home. And how do we make sure that they have enough speed to access the various systems of the office and things like that? But that's not really a disaster anymore. We've had nine months to figure this out. And a lot of companies ramped up their VPN speeds, their their various links into the offices around their uh, you know wherever their locale is and that was that was a distinct shift okay you know beforehand we had you know 20 meg up 20 meg down now we've got uh, 200 up 200 down and we're looking at expanding it more because we want redundancy in case of an outage on one line we want to make sure that other employee all the employees will still be able to access our services which is fine. It's, it's something we have to deal with. But I think probably beyond that, though, that, and, and that's something we're working through and we're, we're planning that out. The, the, it, the, the biggest concern that I have, I was working for a large oil and gas exploration company in the early 2000s. And one of the things that happened while I was there was we were hit by a large computer virus. It was a major one, and it took down a lot of systems. It also required that we go through and we cleaned all of the systems throughout the company, and that required boots on the ground. <laughs> we brought in for my site alone, which had at that time about 700 employees, 
we brought in somewhere around 30 or 40 different technicians to go from office to office to cube farm to cube farm, cleaning these systems of the malware. This is probably, it relates very highly to one other similar situation, which would be, yes, I heard of a company that some a friend of mine went to, and they had released out a, a patch to some software, which actually crashed all of the systems and they had to go through and, again, doing the same thing system to system with a lot of people. We use a term called sneaker net, and that was what it was. You were wandering around utilizing your sneakers instead of the, the, you know, the internal company network to get things done. I think right now this is probably one of our largest concerns in IT that, that I don't know that anybody's really solved this. Sitting off to my side over here, uh, you know, it's a, a, a couple of yards away. Uh, there is my company laptop. And my company laptop, the company I work for right now, uh, if something happens to that, what do I do? Well, I mean, okay, yes, it, it's just me. If, if, if something happens to that laptop, I can go to the office and I follow the social distancing rules and I will wear a mask and, you know, they'll, you know, they'll have a couple of people on hand that will work on my laptop. Hands on, they'll take care of it if they can't take care of it via remote or something like that. But in the description of what I just gave you on those big, huge malware releases or software patch releases where the systems were not even connecting to the network... How do you fix that? How do you handle 50 or 100 or 1,000 employees all of a sudden without any services whatsoever? How do they all get help for their computers in rapid form? And the answer is, I don't know. We're riding in a, in a time where we're going to have to figure this out. We're going to have to figure it out on the fly. I think it would be wise if you're involved with any IT, if you are if you are an IT professional, tuning in to hear what I share. This would be a challenge I have for you, for you to think about the bad things that could happen. To think about how you would react in a situation where, yes, some major malware package just hit every single computer within your company. When everybody is remote and in some situations, yes, people are working from home. They're not working from home a matter of a block away or two blocks away or two miles away. I've worked for companies. I have a coworker where I'm at right now. He is not only a, quite a distance away, about 55, 60 miles away. He's in another state. So there's a lot to this. We have to think about this. We have to plan for this. And you know, maybe you're not an IT professional. Maybe you've got an idea that come to mind and you say, hey, I know how we can solve this. I've got a solution for you. All you got to do, reach out to me here at the show. I will be happy to entertain those and we'll even discuss about this on a future episode. This is Benjamin Rockwell. I hope this was entertaining, a good thought experiment for you at least. Back to you, Hank. Thank you, Benjamin. Well, now that 2020 is gone, one thing didn't change in the tech world. Certain devices, technologies, and servers, they just shut down. The causes vary, as does the level of regret. Some things we'll miss, some things we never cared about, and others we're glad to show the door. Google Play Music. Nearly a decade ago, cloud-based music lockers were the big craze from companies like Amazon, Apple, and Google. But when the dust settles, there can be only one or two or three, and Google decided that 2020 was as good as a time as any to stop duplicating its music efforts, since it's so busy churning out new messaging apps and made December 2020 the final death date for Google Play Music. It was a months-long demise for the service as Google encourages users to transfer to the new offering, YouTube Music. In August, Google blocked new uploads and downloads through its Music Manager app. 
and the music store was closed. In September, streaming music from the cloud started shutting down around the globe, and by the end of last year, all personal music collections were deleted. The service replacing it, YouTube Music, is free to use and offers a premium membership to get ad-free music and to download music for offline listening. And this one, I was so surprised it lasted so long. DSL. Yup, digital subscriber line, very slow internet over telephone service. Goodbye. Farewell, DSL. America's largest internet service provider is giving up on telephone lines for broadband connections. When digital subscriber line DSL first came out, it was a revelation. Instead of the acoustic couple connections, we could use telephone lines to always get on what they call high-speed broadband internet. It wasn't long, however, until we had even faster cable connections. Now the new goal is to get blazing fast fiber connections. DSL has been sitting on the chopping block for a while now, but it wasn't until 2020 that AT&T took action. In October, the company said it would stop selling new DSL connections. We're beginning to phase out outdated services like DSL, and new orders for the service will no longer be supported after October 1. The company said existing subscribers can still use the DSL, but new users won't be able to get the service. The change is hardest for people in rural areas where ATT DSL is the only option. So what else was on the chopping block? Chrome Apps. In January, Google announced it would be putting an end to Chrome Apps. Not extensions, just those standalone web apps that operate in their own windows like a desktop app rather than in a browser tab. This is the second time we've heard the death knell ringing for Chrome Apps. Google announced way back in 2016 that it would give up on Chrome Apps by 2018. That never happened, but this time it appears to be real. Google stopped accepting new public Chrome apps to the Chrome Web Store in March. By June of 2021, Chrome app support on Windows, Mac, and Linux will end. Chrome OS will keep running Chrome apps until June of 2022. Google said it's giving up on Chrome apps due to significant progress of the modern web and its ability to deliver first-class user experiences for users. Chrome apps make less sense when progressive web apps PWAs deliver a similar experience that isn't necessarily tied to Chrome. Plus, with Android and Linux apps running on newer Chrome OS boxes, Google browser apps are no longer necessary. And here's one that I guess no one is going to miss, or maybe just a few gamers. Adobe Flash Player. In the 90s, Adobe Flash wasn't just a component you use on the web. It pretty much was the web. Flash was how we played web games. Every major entertainment site used Flash. And let's not forget about all those Flash-powered ads. Flash was a fantastic tool for its time, but it had security issues and power efficiency problems on laptops, among other drawbacks. So, as the modern web developed, Flash's doom was inevitable. Flash actually held on far longer than anyone expected, considering Apple's co-founder and CEO Steve Jobs fired the first shot at Flash way back in 2010, with his famous open letter. Its decline started officially in 2017, when Adobe said it would kill support for Flash by the end of 2020. Browser makers also started to restrict Flash, and eventually blocked it entirely. Now the time has come for Flash to fade away. So, as of December the 31st last year, Adobe ended support for Flash. The company will block content from running in Flash Player beginning January 12, 2021. That's this month. This is good news for the web's progress. Should you feel a pang of nostalgia, the Internet Archive emulates Flash animations, games, and toys in its software collection and lets you party like it was in 1999. Well, one big item that rode off into the sunset was Windows 7. Versions of the Windows operating systems are so widely used they have several deaths to prepare users for the inevitable. These include the end of retail sales, end of feature support, and the end of security updates. The latter is a final nail in the coffin, and Windows 7's end of life hit in January of 2020. PCs rocking Windows 7 can still operate, of course, and like Windows XP fans before them, 
Windows 7 users will likely keep logging time on old OS regardless of the lack of security updates. By the way, every time I see a doctor, I go to the hospital, I see Windows 7 running along with XP. Of course, they're not communicating with the outside world, so there's really no danger. Windows 7 was a welcome follow-up to Windows Vista, for those who remembered, in keeping with the Microsoft tradition of one bad OS release followed by a good one. Microsoft built on some Vista's strong foundation while removing its annoyances and producing a generally better experience. It was, by all measures, a fantastic operating system. But if you're using a Windows 7 PC, it really is time to move on. Most Windows 7 PCs should be able to run Windows 10. And while the interface isn't the same, it's a fantastic operating system in its own right. I, by the way, maintain one Windows 7 machine. It doesn't go online because I have a peripheral device that is not supported in Windows 10, and the manufacturer of it no longer supports it or have drivers for Windows 10. And that is the Nikon film scanner that cost me over $1,000. I'm not that quick to throw it out. I need a replacement for it. I still have a lot of film that needs to be converted into digital format. Windows 7 is still with us. What's going to happen to the medical devices running on Windows 7? Worldwide, the installed base of Windows 7 is 18%, which includes the United States with an installed base of Windows 7 at about 10%. Considering that all support of Windows 7 by Microsoft ended in January of last year, the number of Windows 7 systems still in use is quite sizable. How do they arrive at these numbers, by the way? It is based on internet traffic. I've been in more medical facilities than I care to be in, and I find that it's almost universal that the medical instruments are operating under Windows 7. These systems do not communicate on the internet, thus the number of Windows 7 systems are probably much higher than what has been published. Many medical devices run on Windows 7. Application software for medical devices are embedded with little to no modification. Support for Windows 7 expired in January of 2020, and as with any software, this is a natural evolution. To keep device secure and maintain, the software has to be upgraded to the latest version. For Windows, that currently means Windows 10. Since Windows 10 itself has moved to a modern lifecycle policy for its operating system, it means that a particular version of Windows 10 is supported for a maximum of 30 months. Unfortunately, according to a recent security report, this new paradigm is going to leave 71% of Windows-based medical devices unsupported. Although medical device OEMs are scrambling to get in front of this issue, there are no easy paths forward. Often, upgrading the operating system means upgrading the processor and motherboard, which implies a full system refresh, and after that, the medical device software has to be retested and revalidated. This assumes that the software does not break with the underlying operating system upgrade. That assumption, however, is not realistic. Hence, medical device OEMs will be forced into a full device upgrade cycle that affects the motherboard, processor, operating system, medical application, and associated libraries. OEMs need a way to quickly upgrade current devices and manage long-term support. An average MRI machine costs more than $1 million. You don't buy another MRI machine because there's a change in the PC operating system. In the case of Windows 10, there are two updates a year. I certainly wouldn't want to be under an MRI machine running with Windows 10. Presenting Marty Winston with All Hands on Tech. If UVC is a color you cannot see, why is it a gold rush? Marty is sounding the alert as scammers have taken to the internet to take advantage of consumers' fear as the virus spreads with phishing emails and phony websites. Remedies for Coronavirus You and people you know could easily get sweet-talked into buying tech products that claim to do some kind of something to protect you against COVID-19. 
Lots of companies came up with lots of those products over the past few months. Many of them had very legitimate intentions. Many of them just looked at it as a way to make money. They saw their offering as golden, as a way to get a lot of people to buy, as a way to bring home a lot of gold. Only many of them thought they had more time. They believed the projections that said vaccines would not be out until summer at the earliest. But that isn't what's happening. Given the most recent distribution announcements, one in every four Americans will receive their first inoculation by the end of January. Sometimes they get those wrong. Could be the end of February. It's still pretty soon. So the gang with the gizmos can feel their dreams of gold turning into dust and not gold dust. Their best hope now for amassing a bankroll is to rush people into buying, to hurry people past the point where anybody has a chance to connect the dots on timing and need and everything else. Tech Products Pandemic Panic. It's a recipe for a fast buck gold rush. But gold is not the color of prevention. The CDC, in its review of all the technologies claiming effectiveness against the coronavirus, only identified one as effective. It isn't gold. It isn't blue. It isn't violet. It's deep ultraviolet in the band closest to x-rays, the band called UVC. That's the letter C, not the word C. Humans can't see UVC. And since the CDC saw UVC as appropriately disinfecting when used against SARS-CoV-2, the coronavirus, a lot of those companies with 2020 visions of wealth claim UVC as part of how they work. In two weeks, you'll want to catch our really snarky report, A Coronavirus Ineffective Tech Hall of Shame. Tonight, there's no need to sharpen the blade before twisting it. Tonight, you can learn to recognize how to recognize what's effective, what's defective, what should get you to call a detective, and what's merely a misunderstood perspective. Ready? Deep ultraviolet, UVC, can't always neutralize viruses. It can't. The exposure has to be strong enough. So, intensity. The exposure has to last long enough. So, duration. Strong enough, long enough. Intensity, duration. There's more, but these already put whole groups of products into the just-say-no category. Anything that claims to use UVC LEDs or solid-state emitters, just say no. They are orders of magnitude too weak to be effective and too small to allow a long enough exposure. Not strong enough, not long enough. LEDs, just say no. Anything that claims to use electrostatics, just say no. The CDC has not found any effective countermeasures based on electrostatics. Anyway, any static charge intense enough to cook a virus or the droplets they ride on wouldn't do any good to any people in the room. But wait, it's about to get scarier than the high-voltage props in a Frankenstein movie. Some products claim that UVC in combination with electrostatics will ionize and disinfect. They'll throw a bunch of science and pseudoscience at you and a bunch of gases and vapors, harmful gases and vapors like ozone, vaporous hydrogen peroxide, hydroxyls. Listen, just for convenience, if there is an X or a Z in their secret recipe, just say no. No ozone, no peroxides, no hydroxyls. Every one of these things is harmful to humans. Most of them irritate the bejeebers out of your breathing passages. And when those get irritated, you get more susceptible to infection, not less. And some of these things, like hydroxyls, can do damage down to a DNA level. Even in a room that's never seen a virus, these so-called cures can be crazy harmful. So, skip the electrostatics and ionization and catalysts and molecular transformations. Just say no. 
the one and only disinfecting technology that impacts the coronavirus, even the mutated variations, is UVC. And yes, it has to be strong enough and it has to expose the virus long enough. But that might not be enough. Here's the challenge. You get infected when coronavirus bodies riding on droplets from coughing, sneezing, or just exhaling get into your nose and mouth. Putting UVC up in the ventilation ducts won't stop that. Putting HEPA filters all over the house won't stop that. Wearing masks or face shields won't stop that. Social distancing won't stop that. But those measures are extremely significant when it comes to making it harder for those droplets to reach you. Those droplets are traveling in real time. They're heading your way. Here they freeze frame. Your best protection is interception, something between you and those droplets that can divert them before they reach you. And there's a special class of UVC countermeasures that can do that. Can, not will, as you'll understand in a minute or so. These are UVC recirculators. They draw air in. The air gets routed past a UVC lamp on a path that's strong enough and long enough to disinfect whatever came in before it gets out. The challenge is in understanding how to use them effectively, which isn't often the case. Remember, a virus may, for a brief time, occupy a space. But the thing you don't want it to infect isn't a space. It's a face, yours, a friend's, a family member's. You must keep the virus from reaching a face. Can a UVC recirculator do that? The answer is a qualified, very qualified, yes. Here are the qualifications. First, the proper place for the device isn't up the wall or over in the corner. It's between pairs of people. Second, because you inhale from a layer of air that goes from about a foot above the tip of your nose to a foot below... The inlet of the device needs to be close to even with the tip of your nose. That's about 60 inches off the floor when standing, about 45 inches off the floor when sitting, and about 36 inches off the floor when sleeping. Third, the shape of the volume of air that gets pulled into that inlet is roughly a hemisphere, shaped something like a button mushroom cap. What's the reach? How far away can it pull in all the virus that's on its way? That, by definition, that is its radius of impact. That's the radius of impact of the device. You might think that being right next to a recirculator protects you the best because the airflow is strongest there. Nope. Between pairs of people. The earlier it can trap and disinfect, the better your odds of nothing getting by it. Several UVC recirculators have been through the review process here. Most are effective. Just as a rule of thumb, if you can feel a strong enough flow of air into the inlet, that's a good start. Too fast a flow can mean there won't be enough duration of exposure, not long enough, to fully disinfect what's in the air. So it's more about power than about speed. If you ever drove a stick shift, it's like driving in second gear. More about power than speed. To recap, electrostatic, just say no. Catalytic, just say no. Ionic, just say no. Anything with X or Z words like oxides, peroxides, hydroxyls, or ozone, just say no. HEPA filters, just say no. UVC from LEDs, just say no. Recirculating UVC, you can say maybe. It depends on the placement between pairs of people and the radius of impact, its zone of protection, and whether its inlet is at the level of your nose. So it's all those no's versus just the one on your face, because you don't owe anybody a gold rush. Next time, you can take a deep dive into water and what tech can do to free it from everything in the water that isn't water, from the sip at your sink to the torrents used in agriculture, manufacturing, and more. It's called getting water out of its shell. And you may find that story super magnetically attractive. Don't miss it if you can. Thank you, Marty. Marty Winston sent me a video clip of a prototype robot named MUVE. The video footage is of the first prototype of the MUVE surface disinfecting robot on a demo run. With the pandemic, 
This is a timely subject to get more information. I asked Marty to cover this in greater detail next week. You could see this video clip on YouTube by doing a search on the words Surface Disinfection Robot. Public Service Announcements For current information and guidance on the vaccine for COVID-19, visit the government website, cdc.gov forward slash coronavirus 2019. The CDC priority recommendations on the vaccine is as follows. 1A, that's the first classification, is for healthcare personnel and long-term care facility residents. That's the frontline essential workers such as firefighters, police officers, correction officers, food and agriculture workers, United States Postal Service workers, manufacturing workers, grocery store workers, public transit workers, and those who work in the educational sector, such as teachers, support staff, and daycare workers. And then there is the 1B classification for frontline essential workers and people aged 75 years and older. That's people aged 75 years and older because they are at high risk of hospitalization, illness, and death from COVID-19. People aged 75 and older who are also residents of long-term care facilities should be offered vaccination in Phase 1A. The last classification that CDC has published is 1C. These are people aged 65 through 74 years of age and people aged 16 through 64 years of age with underlying medical conditions and other essential workers. This is classified as people aged 65 to 74 years because they are at high risk of hospitalization, illness, and death from COVID-19. People aged 65 to 74 years who are also residents of long-term care facilities should be offered vaccination in Phase 1A. People aged 16 to 64 years with underlying medical conditions, which increase the risk of serious, life-threatening complications from COVID-19 and other essential workers such as people who work in transportation and logistics, food service, housing construction and finance, information technology, communications, energy, law, media, public safety, and public health. If you need more information, just go to cdc.gov. Computer Club meetings in the New York, New Jersey, and Connecticut Tri-State Region Most of the computer clubs have begun to schedule their general monthly meetings through teleconferencing. For updated information, visit the website of the computer club. The Westchester PC Users Group has a presentation on the call guy. Thursday, January the 7th, that's tomorrow. Meeting time is 7 p.m. via Zoom virtual meeting, and their website is wpcug.org. The New York Amateur Computer Club has a presentation on speech recognition Thursday, January the 14th at 7 p.m. via Zoom virtual meeting. The website is nyacc.org. The Brookdale Computer Users Group has a presentation on a PC user's guide for avoiding the grief of losing your information. Thursday, January the 28th, meeting time is 6.45 p.m. via Zoom virtual meeting, and the website is bcug.com. The Amateur Computer Group of New Jersey meets via Jitsi. Their website is acgnj.org. The Princeton PC Users Group is via Zoom virtual meeting. Their website is ppcug nj dot apcug dot org and finally computer learning center at ewing they closed up in march and they haven't restarted yet and they're waiting for the ending of the pandemic to resume meetings but their website is c l c e w i n g dot org that's c l c ewing dot org that's a computer learning center at ewing Our website is pcradioshow.org. We are heard each Wednesday at 6 p.m. Eastern Time on prn.fm, streaming on the Internet. 
Podcasts of the program is available on prn.fm on the internet. If you have any questions for us, just send us an email address to hank at pcradioshow.org. In the meantime, stay in touch and remember to do regular backups. I'm Hank Key, and on behalf of Joe King, Michael Horowitz, Marty Winston, and Benjamin Rockwell, we thank you for listening. Stay safe and healthy until we meet again, same time, same station, next week.